Persuasion. Dark Psychology. Techniques to Master Mind Control, Manipulation, and Deception. Robert Moore. Introduction. All of us want to have influence over people and get them to do what we want. Our motives may be evil or benign, that doesn't matter. The fact is that every day you face situations that make you wish you could get people to do what you want them to do. You may want to convince your boss to give you that raise, get the big guy in marketing to have lunch with you, get your children to listen to you, win an argument, sell something, or get people to vote for you, or the person that you support. You can do it the easy way by trying to cajole them or present your side of the argument and take the chance that they'll say no. Or you can do it the easier way by being persuasive, using subconscious techniques, and basically manipulating people into doing or saying what you want. The purpose of this book is to go the latter way and teach you to understand people, comprehend what motivates them, and use that to your advantage. You can use what I tell you to get people to always say yes. I'll teach you how to be compelling and become the controller. I'll also talk to you about neuro-linguistic programming or NLP and how you can use it to master the art of manipulation. We'll also be discussing strategies and tactics you can use to ensure that you win. Leave your ethics at the doorstep, this book is all about deception, controlling people's responses and behavior, and getting them to do what you want them to do. Welcome to the dark side. What are you waiting for? It's Seven Untold Secrets, my best-selling guide on women's psychology, attraction, and seduction. Believe me, this stuff will change your life, you won't regret it. Chapter 1, What Motivates People If you're lucky, you're a people person. You understand people and are good with them. You know what drives them and you know how to use that to get them to do stuff as you want. Life is easy for you. If, however, you're like me and you're not born with some special persuasion talents, then what you're probably doing is taking strategies and techniques that others have used before you and utilizing them, a rather hit and miss way of doing things. If you know what drives people to do what they do or make the decisions that they make, you will have no trouble getting them to go your way. You can apply what you know not just to one person but to groups of people too. Therefore, here are the seven basic motivations that drive people. The need to belong. Everyone feels this need. Look at high school, there are cliques everywhere. Much as we'd like to believe that things change in later life, that is simply not true. Most of us work very hard to be accepted and to avoid being left out. Inevitably, there is some group that you want to be a part of, whether it's the coolest colleagues you have or the upper echelons of the corporate structure. Not being able to become part of your dream group can make you feel angry, depressed, or sad or maybe all of them together. After all, human beings are social creatures and isolation isn't natural for us. We need to feel that we belong somewhere, and we'll work very hard to ensure that we get that acceptance. Since the need to belong is innate to pretty much everyone to some degree, you merely need to identify it and use it to get people to do what you want. Here are some ways in which you can manage that. Use nouns rather than verbs to make your request. Nouns create a sense of group identity and get the person you're targeting to feel as though they're part of something bigger than themselves. Think of blood donation drives. The drives that use a slogan such as, be a donor, are much more likely to be effective than drives that direct you to, donate now. Get people to trust you. If someone trusts you, he or she is much more likely to accede to a request than if they don't. Simple, right? Then why aren't you using it? Use the person's trust to get them to agree to things that you know they wouldn't have agreed to otherwise. For example, getting someone to invest in your fledgling home business is much easier if that person is a friend or an acquaintance you've known for some time. A total stranger who doesn't know you, much less trust you, will balk at just giving you the money. To get people's trust, make them believe that you trust them. This part is very important if you want the previous point to work. Trust doesn't exist in a vacuum, and as such, you'll find that people trust you more easily if you give them the impression that you trust them. You may or may not actually do so, that is besides the point. What you want to remember is that trust engenders trust. If you need someone to do something for you and you know that how much they trust you will have a role to play, start laying the groundwork in advance. 
Use statements such as, I trust you, of course, I know you'll do right by me, and so on to show them that you trust them. They will feel obligated to reciprocate. Habit. Some argue that this should be the number one motivator, considering how many things people do every day are simply out of habit. They don't consciously notice that they are doing those things, and if you were to ask them how and when those habits were formed, most of them wouldn't be able to give you an answer. We've all heard about how it takes a long time to create a new habit. Some say it takes 21 days to start something and make it a new habit, while others believe that the process can take as long as months. Yet, if you stop to think about it, you'll realize that this can't really be true. After all, we've already created so many habits without even realizing that we're doing so. As a matter of fact, you can change an existing habit or create a new one very easily, as long as you understand the science behind the formation of habits. Once you know this, you can use it to get other people to change their habits or create new ones so that they do what you want them to do. Habits really are one of the easiest ways to manipulate people. Here's how you can do it. Anchor the new habit to an existing one. This is the easiest way to start a new habit. The groundwork is already laid and, therefore, creating a new habit doesn't take as much effort as it would to start a new habit from scratch. After all, your entire day is made up of all your habits, from reaching for the alarm so you can snooze a little longer in the morning to brushing your teeth before going to bed every night. Therefore, all you have to do is link your new habit to an existing one. For example, if you don't have breakfast every morning but you do have a cup of coffee and you want to eat healthier, you can start eating something along with that coffee. After some time, you'll find that you associate morning coffee with breakfast. Similarly, you can make people create a habit through anchoring. Take a look at the situation and determine what the new habit needs to be, what existing habit it can be anchored to, and what the new routine is going to look like. The thing to remember here is that you can use this to make people change smaller behaviors rather than larger ones. For example, if you'd like your subordinate to clean up their desk before leaving, and they don't do so, you can try anchoring the cleanup into their habit of meeting with you to discuss the next day's agenda. Simply tell them something along the lines of, hey, why don't you clean up your desk and then we can meet about the agenda. You may physically have to stand there the first couple of times to ensure that they actually do clean their desk. After three or four days though, it will become second nature. Break the new habit into small steps. Again, let's take the desk cleaning example. Say the situation goes somewhat like this, Mike, your subordinate, works on many different things at the same time and his work is strewn all over his desk. He works right till the last minute, so when it is time to leave, he merely picks up his bag, packs his laptop in, and heads home, leaving his desk in absolute disarray. Now, ordinarily this might not be a problem, but you often have client meetings here and they can see Mike's desk quite clearly. You can't move Mike because he needs to be present at these client meetings, and moreover, there is a lack of space already. Also, there is the fact that you and Mike meet every day so that you can discuss next day's agenda. What you'll need to do is first shift the meeting to the end of the day. Then you can ask Mike to straighten up his desk and then meet you. After some time, three or four days, you will no longer need to remind Mike about straightening his desk. Stories What sort of individual would you say you are? Is it accurate to say that you are somebody who helps those in need? Do you keep up on the most recent trends and styles? Is it accurate to say that you are a family individual who invests energy and time to support family connections? We, as a whole, have self-personas. We let ourselves know, and other individuals, stories about our identity and why we do what we do. Some of our self-personas and our stories are conscious, yet others are, to a great extent, unconscious. When you understand how these self-personas work, you can persuade in a way that matches those self-stories, and then, along these lines, motivate individuals to act the way you'd like. For instance, if you can inspire individuals to make one little move that is inconsistent with one of their self-personas, the success level of that one stride in the long run can prompt them to conduct huge change later. You can provoke somebody to change their own story by having other individuals share their stories. On the off chance that somebody hears the right story, 
you can inspire individuals to change their own particular self-stories in just 30 minutes, and that one change can modify their conduct for a lifetime. Writing something down, in longhand, not on a computer, activates certain parts of the mind and makes it more probable that individuals will focus on what they have composed. Carrots on sticks. Have you ever been to a clubhouse? Consider this, you invest a great deal of time and energy attempting to inspire individuals to perform in certain ways, you may even offer rewards or pay individuals for what you want them to do. But then, a clubhouse motivates individuals to pay them. Clubs focus on the process of reward and support. There are two important things the process of reward and support reveals when inspiring people to act. Don't compensate individuals each time they accomplish something if you need to produce reliable, independent behavior. People are more inclined to achieve an objective the nearer they get to it. Let's say you open a coffee house and give individuals a stamp for each espresso they purchase. After 10 stamps, they get a free espresso. Purchases overall may go up, but the problem? When they get that free espresso, their espresso purchasing and drinking will be reined in, having the success of achieving the goal. In a similar carrots phrase, carrots and sticks, still calling to mind the image of a cart driver directing a stubborn mule, a balance between persuasion, the carrot, and punishment, the stick, is presented. However, when you rebuff somebody, it typically only works temporarily. Giving prizes is far more powerful to influence behaviors than discipline. Senses Let's say you're driving and an accident takes place ahead. You know it's disrespectful to slow down and gawk, but then you feel the powerful temptation to do precisely that. Being intrigued by risk is one of our fundamental senses. Impulses are solid, and they influence our conduct. Occasionally, you can motivate individuals to act just by taking advantage of these senses. For instance, people are more motivated by the fear of losing than the likelihood of gaining something. Leverage on that fear of losing, describe what life would be like without the things they love the most. You can also apply this principle to goals and objectives, not only should there be a reward for accomplishing them, but you should also decide the negative consequence when they're not accomplished. The negative consequence will motivate the individual much more than the positive reward. We are essentially all control freaks. The desire to take control over your environment begins as early as four months old. Let someone feel in control, even though they aren't, and they'll be far more inclined to say yes to your requests. When individuals are miserable or terrified, they most crave what is familiar. But, when they're glad and agreeable, they'll look for something new. The desire for mastery. Much more dependable than giving an external reward is the longing for dominance. Individuals are remarkably motivated by learning information and acing certain skills or abilities. Certain circumstances energize that desire for authority, while others hinder it. You can maximize what has already been learned from studying how others achieve authority to set up conditions that will drive that desire for dominance in others and inspire them to act. For instance, Giving individuals self-sufficiency over what they are doing will empower them to ace a skill or ability and will persuade them to work harder. If individuals feel that something is troublesome, they will be more motivated to do it. Don't blend praise with criticism if you are trying to incite the desire for authority. Hold back the praise and only give criticism. Traps of the mind You've likely observed visual fantasies where your eye and mind believe they're seeing things other than what's expected, other than the way they truly are. What you may not understand is that there are subjective figments, as well. The tendencies for this are based on the way we think. Our brains are wired to bounce to snappy conclusions. This is helpful in responding rapidly to our surroundings, however, in some cases, these quick conclusions and choices prompt us to intellectual fantasies. You can utilize these traps of the psyche to motivate individuals to act. For instance, if you offer cash as an incentive, then individuals turn out to be more free and less ready to help other people. People sift through data they don't concur with, yet you can move beyond those channels by first concurring with them. People are more likely to accomplish something in the event that you can motivate them to express it as a question to themselves, will I practice every week? 
rather than if you inspire them to make a revelatory statement, I will practice every week. When you fully comprehend what persuades individuals, then you can change and alter what you do, what you offer, and how and what you ask of individuals. You can change your procedures and strategies to motivate individuals to act without any kind of resentment. Chapter 2, Subconscious Techniques for Persuasion Persuasiveness is an effective aptitude everybody ought to learn. It is helpful in incalculable circumstances. For both your business and your personal life, being inspiring and influential to others will be the foundation for accomplishing objectives and being successful. Learning about the traps of persuasion will give you new awareness for when they appear in sales messaging you read. The greatest advantage? Your cash stays in your pocket. It literally pays for you to understand exactly how sales representatives and marketers offer you items that you don't really require. The following are some persuasive techniques that work on a subconscious level. Outlining Impacts Thought Let's say you're thirsty, and someone hands you a glass of water not quite full. The glass is half full. An optimist would outline the reality of your glass of water in that way. Outlining is used as an approach to modify how we classify, connect, and attach meaning to every aspect of our lives. The headline, FBI Operators Surround Cult Leaders Compound, creates a mental picture strikingly different from another version of the headline for the same story, FBI Specialists Raid Small Christian Gathering of Women and Children. Both headlines may convey what happened, however, the selected words affect the reader's mental and emotional responses, and therefore direct the impact the target events have on the article's readers. Outlining is employed by apt government representatives. For example, representatives on both sides of the abortion debate refer to their positions as pro-choice or pro-life. This is intentional, as pro has a more positive association to build arguments on. Outlining an event, product, or service this way unobtrusively utilizes emotional words strategically to persuade individuals to see or accept your perspective. Creating a convincing message is as easy as selecting words that summon strategic pictures in the minds of your audience. Indeed, even with neutral words surrounding it, a solitary stimulating word can be powerful. Reflecting as persuasive strategy. Reflecting, often called the chameleon effect is the act of replicating the movements and nonverbal communication of the individual you want to persuade. By mirroring the actions of the individual listening, you create an appearance of empathy. Hand and arm motions, inclining forward or reclining away, or different head and shoulder movements are types of nonverbal communication you can reflect. We, as a whole, do this without much thought, and now that you're becoming aware of that, you'll notice not only yourself but others doing it, as well. It is important to be graceful, thoughtful about it and allow just a couple seconds to pass between their movements and you reflecting them. Highlight scarcity of a product or cervix E. The concept of scarcity is often employed by marketers to make products, services, or associated events and deals appear to be all the more engaging on the grounds that there will be restricted accessibility. The belief is that there is a huge amount of interest for it if availability is scarce. For example, an ad for a new product might say, get one now. They're selling out quickly. Again, it literally pays to know that this is a persuasion strategy that you will see everywhere. Consider this concept the next time you settle on your buying choice. This principle triggers a feeling of urgency in most individuals, so it is best used when applied in your marketing and sales copy. Reciprocity helps make a future commitment. When somebody helps us out, we feel responsible to provide a proportional payback. All in all, the next time you need someone to accomplish something beneficial for you, consider doing something unexpectedly pleasant for them first. At work, you could pass a colleague a lead. At home, you could offer to loan some landscaping tools to a neighbor. The details, where or when you do it, won't make a difference, the key is to supplement the relationship without being sought out first. Lead with value and give it freely, without overtly expecting anything in return, and their response will come. Timing can bolster your good fortune. Individuals will be more pleasant and accommodating when they're mentally exhausted. Before you approach somebody for something they may not otherwise participate in, consider holding back until they've recently accomplished something mentally challenging. 
Consider making your offer toward the end of the workday, for example, when you can get a colleague or collaborator on the way out of the office. Whatever you may ask, a reasonable reaction could be, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Enhance compliance to acquire a needed result. To avoid cognitive dissonance, we all try to be true to how we've acted in the past. A reliable technique business people use is to shake your hand as they are consulting with you. We have been taught that a handshake equals a sealed deal, and by doing this before the arrangement is really sealed, the business person has taken a step to persuade you into believing the deal is already done. One approach to employing this yourself is influencing individuals to act before their minds are made up. Let's say that you are roaming downtown with a companion, and you decide you want to go see a movie at the local theater, yet, your companion is undecided. Compliance can come into play if you begin strolling toward the theater while they are still thinking about it. Your companion will probably consent to go once they realize you are strolling in the theater's direction. Attempt fluid discourse. In the natural flow of our speech, interjections and reluctant expressions act as fillers when we need a moment to think or select the right word, for example, um, or, I mean, and obviously the newly pervasive, like. These fillers have the unintended impact of making us appear to be unsure and doubtful and, in this way, less convincing. When you're certain about your message, others will be more effectively persuaded. If you have trouble finding the right words at the right time, Practice some free flow association every day in front of the mirror for 60 seconds. You can add it to your morning ritual, or you can do it while having a shower, like I usually do. Basically, your goal in these 60 seconds is to jump from one topic to another very quickly, by associating words. Do your best to avoid, um, like, or other fillers. Example, the water on my back right now is so hot, it reminds me of the hot weather in California. I love Cali, I like the food there. Mexican food is so spicy and hot, like Mexican women. I remember Marcela, that one Mexican girl I met last time I was there, she was probably the only blonde girl from Mexico. She was blonde like a Swedish model. I've never been to Sweden, but I've heard it's cold out there. And so on, until you get to 60 seconds without pauses or interjections. Once you reach that point after some practice, you can aim for 120 seconds. Once you've done that, the next step is to practice this game with other people. You don't need to go on for a full two minutes straight, but while you're talking to someone, you can go on a tangent for 20 seconds and practice the free flow association skill. You'll practice and improve tremendously, while they'll be wondering, this guy is interesting. I really want to know what he's going to say next. Group affinity can affect decision s. We always seek the people around us to help us make decisions, people have an inherent need for belonging and acknowledgement, as previously discussed. We have a much higher tendency to imitate or be persuaded by somebody we like or by somebody we see as an influential leader. A compelling approach to make this work for you, bolstering your good fortune, is to be viewed as a leader by your target audience, regardless of whether you officially have the title. It helps to be enchanting and sure, so individuals will have more confidence in your message. Keep improving yourself, and you'll soon become more magnetic than everyone else. If you're interacting with an individual who doesn't consider you to be a powerful person, for example, a rival at work or your irritating in-laws, you can, in any case, exploit group affinity. For example, if you praise a leader that individual respects, that praise then activates the positive associations in that individual's brain about that admired leader, which creates a mental space where they can relate those qualities with you. Create a photo opportunity with man's best friend. Give your target audience the idea that you're trustworthy, and motivate them to be loyal to you, by taking a photo of yourself with a pooch, it doesn't need to be your own puppy. This can make you appear kind and cooperative, but keep these kinds of photo ops to a minimum setting up an excessive number of pictures looks amateurish. On a side note, it pays to know your audience, if you know they share a lot of cat pictures, maybe try a picture or two with a feline friend, too. Offer a drink. This might seem too easy, but giving the individual you want to persuade a warm drink to hold while you're conversing with them can be persuasive in itself. The warm vibe you've offered their hands, and their body can intuitively make them see you as candidly warm, affable, and inviting.
offering a chilly drink can do the opposite. As a rule, individuals tend to feel frosty and seek out warm beverages when they're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, so take care of that need keeping in mind the end goal to make them more open. Start with a simple, yes, question. Start the discussion with an inquiry that creates a, yes, reaction. Nice weather we're having, isn't it? Or, you're searching for a great price on a car, right? When you get somebody saying yes, it's anything but difficult to motivate them to proceed, up to and including, yes, I'll get it. You can counter this in your daily life by giving cautious answers to even the simplest questions. Gently break the contact boundary. You could be sealing a deal or asking somebody out for coffee, and touching them, in a modest and suitable way, can enhance your odds of hearing, yes, because you have intuitively triggered the human yearning to connect. In a professional setting, it is normally best to touch verbally by giving consolation or acclaim, as a physical touch could be seen as lewd behavior. In sentimental circumstances, any delicate touch from a lady will more often than not be taken well. Men will need to proceed here with extreme caution, keeping in mind the end goal is to abstain from making a lady feel uncomfortable. Chapter 3, How to Make People Buy What You're Selling While the quality of the product, advertising it, and clarity of message are all very important, here are 50 psychological techniques, inspired by the 2014 book The Small Big, Small Changes That Spark Big Influence co-written by Steve J. Martin, Noah Goldstein, and Robert Cialdini, that you can use to ensure people will buy whatever it is that you're selling. Several psychological techniques for influence and persuasion are based on Cialdini's six principles of persuasion, authority, reciprocity, liking, scarcity, consistency, and consensus, and the popular theory that our brains have two systems for deduction and fixing issues, system 1, quick, impulsive, and instinctive, and system 2, moderate contemplative, and intentional. The majority of people will find themselves utilizing System 1, only relying on System 2 when it's necessary. The following mental prompts include providing persuasive data in a way that best fits how our System 1 minds work. Persuade customers to purchase your product service by providing them real-time or long-term statistics regarding the number of customers who have already purchased your product service. Persuade people to embrace another, or your, perspective, especially when going against a group-slash-tradition, by associating that group-slash-tradition with undesirable outcomes or situations. Persuade customers to invest by discussing the losses or gains of working outside the standard, for instance, if a person purchasing is the standard, then note the losses of not purchasing, however, if making a purchase is not the standard, note the gains of purchasing, or, working outside the standard. Persuade customers to purchase new products or services, at the risk of deviating from a social standard, by utilizing active social proof with images or statistics showing others actively purchasing said product or service. For example, if the social standard is to download similar software illegally, use a series of images to show how others bought your software through approved channels. Persuade individuals to focus on your message by including their first and last names whenever realistically possible. Using a person's proper name prompts them to pay attention. This originates from the cocktail party theory, which is based on the phenomenon that even above idle group conversation, a person will pay attention when somebody speaks his or her name. Persuade customers to purchase with a central message highlighting how your audience is both comparable to fellow purchasers and standouts from those who don't purchase. Persuade individuals to take up your promotional offers by keeping them fresh and innovative. Similar to the adage about familiarity and contempt, familiarity in message style, format, or tone can breed brand-slash-message boredom in your audience. Persuading customers to purchase can be easier if you start by confirming a pre-sale agreement. For instance, voluntarily joining an email list. People are more likely to consider your offers if they enjoy, and trust, the regular messages you send. From the previous step, persuading customers and people in general, often works best by making advances in short strides. Start by reassuring them and asking them to partake in a minimal, and free, if possible, act that leads them toward purchasing. Affirming and proactive cues can be employed later to seek an actual purchase, once trust has been established. Persuade individuals to purchase, or even consider, 
items or services that are typically frowned upon or outright shunned by giving them an opportunity to counter the feelings of guilt and pursue the desired item or service without worry. Persuade customers with images or messages showing how purchasing or using your item or service is beneficial to others as opposed to focusing on individual profit. Persuade individuals by associating any preferred conduct with somebody they know, respect, or admire, and then connect the act opposite to the preferred conduct to losing or someone or something the target audience does not hold in high regard. Sometimes, the idea of not assicating with a loser can be a stronger motivator than being associated with a winner. Persuading customers to make a purchase can be easier by creating and sharing clearly written goals that help them anticipate the future purchase. When that purchase opportunity is presented, allow them to determine how, when, and where the purchase will occur, when logical. Persuade customers or individuals to commit to a future purchase or service exchange by offering pre-sale orders or a sign-up to receive notifications when the product or service is available. Examples are subscription or membership services that secure spots for early adopters or ardent fanatics. On the coattails of the previous point, you can persuade customers to make a purchase now by highlighting how much better off their future self will be if they lock in their chance to purchase or use the service now. Persuade individuals to act with a challenge that isn't so much of a challenge. Explain how your audience will gain by taking part in a passable test. People are motivated by problems that require solutions, but that motivation is strongest when we consider those solutions achievable. Persuade customers to make a purchase by presenting a choice between two items or services. From there, describe what they'll forfeit if they don't pick your ideal option. Persuade individuals and potential customers alike by establishing clear and meetable expiration dates for your offer. The concept of a ticking clock creates a sense of urgency that can generate a larger number of responses. On the other side of that coin, you can persuade waiting customers to hold on and stay tuned by implementing entertaining, educational, or even distracting elements in your messages, like polls, testimonials, and other interactive concepts. For instance, some major theme parks provide engaging performances or other delights to prevent patrons from becoming restless, bored, and eventually angry at the idea of wasting time or effort. Persuade individuals by tapping into the power of potential. People love the idea of future potential and often find that idea more convincing than established reputation. Especially if you can tie this concept to the identity of an underdog who overcomes obstacles to achieve that future potential. Persuade customers to make a purchase with an initial request that they share any worries or doubts with you. You'll want to save your attempt to close the deal until the end of your message. It helps, in messages like this, to present your ideas in a simple format like a table or bulleted list. Persuading individuals is easier when your message explains, or establishes, how you are an authority. Start by sharing some of your experience, interests, or special causes, especially, if they align with those of your target audience. This also helps you appear legitimate and trustworthy. Persuade customers and individuals to act with a message that spurs a positive reaction. People tend to be motivated by their emotional, internal responses more than by what they learn from seeing or hearing in your actual message. Persuading customers to make a purchase is easier when you appear to have integrity, as previously mentioned. An easy way to do this is calling attention to a specific, if unrelated, shortcoming while highlighting your relevant talents. Persuade people to focus on the pertinent part of your message by strategically situating the idea or concept as if it were in a spotlight. Think about how the audience will look at or otherwise interact with your message and format your central idea with the complementary ideas surrounding it. Persuade individuals and customers to act with an offer made in context. In other words, within an active situation or easily understood simulation, that clearly explains how your audience can use the gains from taking your offer. Persuasion is much easier when you feel confident making your offer. One way to do this is to get individuals or customers, to seek you out in your own backyard, what sports fans might call taking advantage of your home field. Where you're most comfortable is where you're most confident. From the previous point, persuading customers and individuals with offers made confidently is generally more convincing. Be willing to be open, friendly, and straightforward to convince others to purchase or act with total certainty. 
persuade individuals and customers by invoking the concept of love. Drawing an affiliation where taking your offer is the same as loving is an effective and influential message. Persuading people, and especially customers, is easier when you know your audience, personalize your messages, and make offers that speak to their individual desires and inclinations. Do what you can to show this customer you do not see him or her as a run-of-the-mill client. Persuade people to act or accept your offer with a proactive effort to help them out before they ask it of you. This creates an environment for setting up a response later, typically, a purchase or service exchange. This orchestrated trade is based on the concept of reciprocity defined earlier in the book. Persuade people to act by showing gratitude for past action. A simple, thanks for doing business with us, can help secure future purchases or assistance from established patrons and partners. Taking a similar tack to technique number 31, you can persuade customers or individuals to act or make a purchase with a unique and unexpected offer. Most people love a surprise, but an excessive number of free samples can change your audience's desire. Be strategic to astound customers and make sure your offer stands out. Persuading customers and individuals can be as simple as requesting that they perform a certain act or make a purchase. Because it's easy to get caught up in the process, people can overlook the probability that others will make a purchase or accept an offer after hearing a direct and considerate pitch. Persuading people is often attached to the art of pursuit, and like the previous technique, can be as simple as being proactive and asking for what you want. Presenting your ideal terms in an initial meeting, you can psychologically guide your client to accept your underlying terms with minimal question or doubt. Persuade individuals and customers with messages that include and account for exact figures or data, for example, a price point of $191.50, as opposed to $200 feels more legitimate than the rounded price points. Persuade customers to make a purchase with the 99 cents price point. Even though people know there is only one cent to go from $4.99 to $5, our reactions are driven by that initial number. For every potential customer seeing your product or service, there will always be a dollar between $4.99 and $5. In a similar vein, considering how people think of money and value, Try persuading customers to make a purchase by situating what you are offering next to a costlier choice. Though, you may not ever sell that costlier item, it works to sell the product or service you want the customer to purchase. Persuade individuals or customers to take your offer or make a purchase with a concise, direct appeal, strip the offer down to its essence. A mess of collected ideas and promotions is far less persuasive than the offer's most basic benefit. When that alone doesn't work, try adding a unique or customized advantage to boost your offer's value. Persuade customers to make a purchase with the concept of unit asking. Enhance the perceived value of your product by breaking down your price points to reveal how a single unit or use compares to the overall worth of your product or service. Persuasion is easier with personalization, to harken back to technique number 30. Knowing your audience, or, in this case, your customers, can help you customize the particular advantages of your offer to whomever is purchasing your product slash service or taking you up on what you're offering. Persuade customers to make a purchase by reminding them they could save money with your offer, and then tell them what they can do with the cash they spare purchasing from you. People often overlook the non-financial expenses for the products or services they buy. Persuading people to keep acting when they are struggling with assignments or difficult tasks can be as simple as showing them their progress and then what remains. More clearly, after they've taken the first few steps, provide a specific measurement for progress made, for example, 20% done, and after the 50% mark, provide a specific measurement for the balance, for example, 20% remaining. Persuade people to act or take a specific offer with a minimized selection of choices. Present an inflexible offer with specific choices and strategically organized ways to buy. Give your target audience a clear and direct route to the choice you want them to make with no shortcuts or deviations. Persuade people by invoking the concept of FOMO. This is the fear of missing out and is as easy as provoking a person's inherent dread of passing up a major opportunity. Clearly indicate the benefits that could be lost when they choose against making a purchase. 
Persuading customers to make a purchase in-store can be enhanced by offering more physical space in which to stand and look around. Think larger aisles, smaller, less obtrusive point-of-purchase displays, or roomier demonstration spaces for vendors. Even a little extra space boosts your customers' trust in their inherent capacity to make positive decisions. Persuasion can also be enhanced with negative points of influence showing customers what they miss by indicating the drawbacks of not purchasing or purchasing from a competitor. These negative points of persuasion, if constructed and presented effectively, could be more significant and influential than positive points. Persuade people to act to your benefit with proof that your product or offer comes without stress, aside from whatever problems may show up with the product or offer itself, by stating clearly that if problems occur, you're reliable and will deal with it. When customers know they can trust you, they are more likely to pick your product over others. Persuade customers to make a purchase with breaking news type data. This feels and sounds more convincing to customers who may need some motivating. Don't have access to pertinent breaking news? Make any news updates as clear and accurate, think about the who, what, when, where, etc., as you can. The more specific you are, the more legitimate you appear. Persuading people to act in your benefit can be as easy as making them smile or laugh. When you can make individuals or customers laugh and smile, you invoke positive feelings, which they will associate with you, and instigate trust. Additional persuasion tips There are also other tips you can use to make people buy what you're selling, whether it's a product or a service. Read carefully, and you will notice that you can start using what you read as early as today. Tip number one. Give customers multiple, next step, products to buy. If you want to sell more, when you're already trying to create a product or a service that sells, you should provide your customers a product path to walk down. In short, you need to think about two, three, four, or more products down the same line, so when your buyer gets what he or she needs from the first product, you have already provided something else to solve their next problem as well. For example, if you are selling a new kind of laptop, you can then create a mailing list to give customers the possibility to stay up to date about new software or hardware related to the product they've already bought. So, to be even clearer, you can ask yourself, what does a customer need immediately after using my product or service? Then start thinking about ideas for additional products or services to create as soon as possible. Tip number two, generate ideas for content quickly. If you want to spend less time creating products and focus on making money instead, carefully read this section. When you talk about information products, simpler is better. Communicate everything in a simple and efficient way. If you do this in the right way, people will keep coming back to you to have even more of what you offer them. Coming up with content sometimes seems to be the most important point for the majority of content creators, because they think they have to show everything and they get stuck not being able to find the perfect thing to create. If you find yourself in this category of creators and you're paralyzed, without any more ideas, there's an easy way to overcome that. All you need to do is have a look at what's already been created, or written, or drawn, and so on, within your realm of experience, then hold a brainstorming session with yourself and try to figure out a new idea to fill a gap among what's already out there. Well, I'm definitely not saying you should steal other people's ideas. I'm just saying that if you're stalled, consider similar content to yours from different sources and then write down topics you can speak about from what you already know. Then reduce the list to the most important things your customers need to know, and from there, create the final product. Maybe it won't be perfect, or the most artistic, or coolest, result, but don't worry. You're doing good work by trying to solve people's problems with your information, product, or book. So, there's no shame in finding inspiration from other people's work, as long as you try to communicate that knowledge in your own personal style. So, when you're not continuing your work because you're feeling stuck, find some resources that already exist, write everything down on a list for future topics, and then think carefully about what your customers need. With that angle, create the best thing you can from there. Tip number three, create multiple formats for your products. What you create shouldn't look like every other mass-produced product, but instead, it should effectively solve your customers' problems, without losing on the formats you choose or the quality of the product. People like learning and seeing things in different formats, and everyone has their preferred formats, video, 
book, audio, and so on. To sell even more, you need to offer the product you're selling in multiple formats. However, this is not clearance to create lots of low-quality products. Always attempt to do your best, always offering your very best work, perhaps just not going mad doing it. The good news for you is that creating multiple formats and making them seem good isn't a painful process. You can find many tutorials on the internet to learn how to make compelling and effective audio files, videos, and PDFs to improve your skills for creating different products in multiple formats. It's quite easy, after all, even if you don't want to spend several hours learning new technological skills, you can add just one additional format to your collection of products. On the other hand, if you already have different formats, try to make them look or sound even better in a simple way. So, add at least one additional format to your collection of products, or improve what you've already done. Take imperfect action now, because you can always make more changes later. Tip number four, do something to increase the perceived value of your products or services. Often, the thing preventing the customer from buying your product or service is the fact that the real value of it is hard to see. Usually a customer just thinks about the price, and we saw in the list above how customers can get hung up on price over value. You, on your own, must do the work to show your prospects the value of your offer and the outcome they can get by taking you up on it. Your job is to build up its perceived value, through meaningful and clear statements. Will it save them $30 and some other cost per month? Well, that's $360 a year. Will it help them save an hour a day? Well, that's 30 hours a month they can spend doing what they love to do. To do this, break your product down into its individual components, revealing its essence and basic overall benefit, to show them how every single part is made, and that each one is worth more than the total of its parts. Going back to the laptop example, you can highlight the audio system, or the optional devices, or the excellence of the design itself. But, breaking your product down into its components and explaining each one separately, on your sales page or when you talk with your prospects, can help you focus on the benefits of each part. Tip number 5, get new products up for sale on an ongoing basis. Don't hesitate. Creating new products is easy once you make the creation process fast and simple. Many people work and go crazy over one product and just get stuck with that, because it needs a lot of work to finish and maintain. It's simply not the right way to make a lot of money and convince people to buy your products or services. You should come out regularly with new products, once a week, once a month, as often and as regularly as you can. You don't have to run very fast, but you should always be creating and working. More products available equals more sales. Easy game. However, remember to also pace yourself, maybe focus on evaluating every two or three months, or take some time between new products if you are making something larger or more complex. Set up a network where you can share your products or services roadmap with your customers, so when they are satisfied with the first product or service, another one is already there, ready to be sold. If your aim is smaller products, you can easily produce more regularly. Aim for a weekly or monthly basis, but it totally depends on you. Solve one problem at a time and make one customer satisfied with what he or she really desires at a time, so you can have a steady stream of ongoing income coming in. Maybe it sounds difficult now, but I assure you it's not. It gets easier as time goes on and you continue doing it. Just relax and don't focus all your energy on creating some magic bullet, rather, focus on solving problems in the easiest way possible. Take your product or service roadmap and schedule out the products or services you are going to create over the next 6 or 12 or 24 months, then choose a deadline for each one and write it down on your agenda. At the end, make it real. Make something you can really commit to and the work is basically already done. Chapter 4, The Art of Being Compelling Occasionally, I meet somebody or see a speaker who is just so compelling that they leave an enduring impact on me. I'm certain you grasp what I mean. I'm talking about the person who appears to capture everybody's attention. The person who has people in their audience nodding and understanding every step of the way. This kind of person takes to the platform and has everybody captivated. There's just something about them. Be that as it may, what precisely is it? What is that something that makes them stand out? 
That makes them appear to be totally and utterly great? That makes them so compelling? Is it knowledge? All things considered, a person can be clever and compelling, beyond any doubt. However, a person can be wise, an out-and-out virtuoso, and not be extremely compelling. Trust me, I've had numerous discussions with individuals much more brilliant than me and immediately noticed they were simply not compelling. I've likewise observed individuals leading meetings who are much more quick-witted than others in the room. And still, not compelling. I've viewed numerous talks where the keynote speaker displays a great deal of information, truth, pivotal research. Better believe it, at the end of the day, not compelling. If it's not insight alone that compels us, what is it? All things considered, to start, the individual who shows genuine enthusiasm for their topic and audience is compelling. Whether in casual discussion, meetings, or at the platform, they give us the distinct inclination that they care about us. If they're thinking about us, in this way, we assume they like us. And, we like individuals who like us, that's the reciprocation and likability principles at play. When an individual has enthusiasm for what they are stating, they are compelling. When they truly put stock in their subject and they have a deep longing to share their thoughts, we respond with the need to hear them. During the best public speaking classes, most instructors generally give their students the chance to choose their own argument. Along these lines, they will turn over every leaf to locate the absolute best data to share, and after that, they will convey it like they care, since they truly do. They're roused, so they move people. An individual with certainty is compelling. There is adamant support for what they have confidence in. There is no room for qualifiers like, I'm not certain, or, I'm most likely off base. Sentences end positively, without a question mark or questioning tone. This kind of individual sits straight, stands tall, and looks at the audience without flinching. They are conversational, grinning and transmitting energy. Excitement for the topic is clear, and the audience is a magnet. That excitement pulls the audience into his message. We end up clinging to his words, one after the other. Some may call it appeal, some call it fascination. Others simply call it that extraordinary something. It doesn't generally make a difference what we call it, we just know it when we see it. When there's this simple engaging quality about a person, it makes us inspired by them and their thoughts. It's when this happens that we see them as compelling. Have you ever considered how to be more compelling? If you need to make a change, you want to have an effect. Having an effect requires a reason or cause and an eagerness to contribute a bit of yourself to effect change. A compelling individual stands a far better shot of generating results than the individuals who are not. Affecting change relies on your capacity to convey your message in a way that causes others to react to you. In the event that you are not a compelling individual, you may be frustrated at your inability to generate results. Before you get disappointed with yourself, pause for a minute to consider how you can boost your impact. Everybody wants to affect change at some level. Each of us has a need to have an impact. Our capacity to have an effect on our environment is a central part of our self-character or self-esteem. So, if you need to be more compelling, it begins with you. There is one word that might shine some light on this concept. Let's look at the meaning of charisma. It originates from the Greek word charisma, which means importance, support, or divine blessing. Its root is charis, which means beauty or grace. Charisma can be exceptionally useful to the individual looking to have an effect. It is easier to accept and follow a charismatic individual over one with the excitement of a wallflower. Roger Ailes, former CEO of Fox Broadcasting, writes about charismatic leaders, like former President John Kennedy, in his 1989 book You Are the Message, Getting What You Want by Being Who You Are. At the beginning of the ninth chapter, Beyond Charisma, Control of the Atmosphere, he makes the claim that every leader wants to have a charisma in that special, inspiring quality of leadership sense. It is having an extraordinary, moving quality that helps you be compelling and intriguing. He concludes, some people seem to have charisma naturally, others work hard to achieve it. It makes sense that everybody needs some level of charisma, or the world would be a boring place. One result of charisma is certainty. 
it is hard to align yourself with any individual who needs it. Uncertain individuals are not trustworthy, and it is implausible for you to anticipate that anybody will put their trust in you, particularly individuals in power or who have real duties. The first step to be more compelling is to be more authentic. Authenticity is the act of being the individual you are. Write a short sentence or paragraph to describe your ideas, your beliefs. Try to catch the essence of who you are as opposed to describing yourself with your economic well-being, I'm a king, or employment, I'm the president. Those are worldly in nature and shaky foundations for your character because they can change. Instead, concentrate on your tendencies, your inherent nature, for example, are you mindful, engaged, keen, supportive, shrewd, thrifty, or empowering? Likewise, consider causes, traditions, or hobbies that characterize your life in your statement. Being who you are is one of the most important things to being more compelling. This effort can lead individuals to trust in you and enhance your capacity to persuade those you look to impact. Building a sound and steady individual character is fundamental for individuals to bolster you, your thoughts, or your cause. It is anything but difficult to connect compelling individuals to charismatic personalities. Ailes worked with U.S. presidents and motion picture stars throughout his long profession. He understands charisma, and likewise understands everybody can use some level of charisma if they are to have any impact on others. However, he indicates that it isn't something reserved for a few. He expands our view of the charismatic individual by stating that charisma doesn't require a man to be noisy or ostentatious. The best test is whether individuals respond to you rather than you responding to them. Inspiring others to listen and respectfully respond is a genuine sign that you have a compelling impact. So how would you do this? Consider these attributes charismatic individuals normally display. They comprehend and acknowledge who they are and present a strong personality. This helps them identify with others and listen to others respectfully. They accept life as it is and live authentically. They have a mission and objectives for life that are greater than themselves. Compelling individuals don't live by the expression, it's all about me. They anticipate good faith without entitlement. They take a long-term approach that may require a great deal of effort, yet it doesn't require a blind leap of faith for more difficult cases. They respect the contributions of others to their authority or work. The very meaning of charisma is comfort. A positive reaction does not boost their inner self, but rather prompts them to share credit. They understand the value they bring to a situation and don't question their capacities. They are skilled individuals who convey confidence and show others how it's done. They focus on their central goal or mission, and the associated objectives. This is only possible when these goals and objectives are consistent with their characteristic inspirations. Certain lifetime accomplishments, one-of-a-kind encounters, or individual qualities can boost your charisma. Consider the visually impaired man who climbs Mount Everest, a lady surviving a horrifying plane crash, or being raised in an environment that produces personality traits such as boldness, authority, and confidence as illustrations. These are things that you don't really have control over in your life. You can be more compelling by taking dynamic strides other charismatic individuals have taken to enhance your own personality. Chapter 5, Neurolinguistic Programming and Manipulation Everybody's conceived with a similar essential neurology. Our capacity to do anything in life, whether it's swimming the length of a pool, cooking a feast, or writing a book relies upon how we control our sensory system. Along these lines, quite a bit of neurolinguistic programming, NLP, is dedicated to figuring out how to think more effectively and communicate more adequately with yourself as well as other people. But what does NLP really mean? Neuro is about your neurological framework. NLP depends on the fact that we encounter the world through our five basic senses and interpret that sensory data, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, into manners of thinking, both conscious and unconscious. Perspectives trigger the neurological framework, which influences physiology, feelings, and conduct. Linguistic alludes to the way individuals utilize language to understand the world and then convey that experience to others. In NLP, linguistics is the investigation of how the words you speak impact your experience. 
Programming draws intensely from learning hypotheses and determines how we code, or rationally perceive and understand, our experience. Your own programming comprises the inner procedures and methodologies, thinking designs, that you use to make decisions, fix problems, learn, analyze, and achieve desired outcomes. NLP demonstrates to individuals generally accepted methods to record their encounters and rearrange their inward programming to get the results they need. The NLP Communication Model The NLP Communication Model, produced by Richard Bandler and John Grinder, depends on psychological brain research. As indicated by the NLP correspondence display, when somebody acts intentionally, their external behavior, a response is created inside you, your internal, i.e. mental or emotional, reaction. Which makes you react intentionally, your external behavior, which then makes a chain response inside the other individual, their internal reaction, and the cycle proceeds. The internal reaction is comprised of a person's thought processes and the nature of their mental state. The thought processes comprise self-talk, pictures, and sounds, and the mental state is the sentiments that are experienced. How to Manipulate Using NLP Controlling Thoughts The way our brain works can be seen remotely through an electroencephalograph, EEG, and it measures the condition of one's awareness, the force of thought waves, sharpness, and action of the psyche. Science has identified four different brainwave states, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Beta is the conscious state we experience every day, for example, when walking around, with brainwaves in the 14 to 30 Hz range. We generate beta brainwaves by moving around and thinking. In this state, the brain is constantly active, and you may experience a lot of thoughts going on in your mind, that's the typical situation of a stressed out, 21st century person. Alpha is a lightly relaxed, drowsy state. The brain is operating in the 7 to 14 Hz range, and this is where a state of hypnosis and visualization can occur. This is the typical state that you experience when you start a meditation session. Theta is the light sleep state or deep meditative state, and it's also the lucid dreaming state. The brain operates in the 3 to 7 Hz range. This state is easy to access through guided meditations or by just going to sleep. Finally, delta is the deep sleep, healing state, which generates brainwaves in the 0.5 to 3 Hz range. Why am I telling you this? Well, you're here to learn how to persuade, influence, and manipulate other people's minds. To effectively do that, you can take advantage of the alpha state. In fact, this specific state operates as a bridge between the conscious mind, beta state, and the subconscious mind, theta state. The alpha state allows us conscious access to the unknown material located in our subconscious mind. When you find yourself in a hypnotic state, this alpha bridge, gives you the opportunity to reprogram your subconscious mind, because your psyche turns out to be more suggestive to the orders and can be easily customized. You can access this knowledge and information to help you better understand your actions, behaviors, and motivations, and you can also change your habits and belief systems. Of course, anything you can apply to yourself, you could also apply it to others, that's why being able to induce an alpha state in other people is an invaluable skill to master. You have to keep in mind, though, brainwave states do not exclude each other. You can be in the beta state of mind while walking or talking, but still be producing some alpha waves as well. If you begin to relax a little bit, you can start generating more alpha waves than beta waves. The same happens when you close your eyes and take a deep breath, you'll probably enter a deeper alpha state, even though you'll most likely generate some theta waves too. Remember that you are the one who generates these different electrical signals. And by learning how to manipulate your brain waves just a little, you can also learn how to generate the mental state necessary to effectively hypnotize yourself or others. Entering the alpha state. First of all, you need to relax. Close your eyes and take a few deep breaths, and you'll soon be generating some alpha waves. When someone achieves an alpha state, their subconscious mind is ready to be manipulated or programmed. At this point, you can use suggestions and visualizations to send effective messages to their subconscious mind to make a desired change happen. Visualizations are especially effective because the subconscious mind works best with symbols, images, and clear visions. 
If the person has old belief systems or core issues that are left intact, his or her mind may be conflicted trying to reconcile the old belief systems with the new ones. So it's important to first let go of beliefs or core issues that created the unwanted behavior in the first place, and only then can we influence the subconscious mind to help us create the desired behavior. Mind Perception Impressions from signals in our surroundings unintentionally impact our thoughts to a specific degree. Up to 99% of our subjective actions might be unconscious. Along these lines, it is possible to influence someone's psyche by priming the environment, putting a specific object or message near the subject that sidesteps the conscious personality, but is picked up instead by the subconscious personality. Most traps of the mentalists work exactly in this way, as they may wear a red tie that will be overlooked by the conscious personality as though unimportant, but registered by the unconscious personality of the observer without even knowing it. Presumably, it's done by using the word red as a part of the discussion, for example, which will trigger the shading red in the observer's brain. These ideas are validated in the onlooker with deliberate behaviors that are utilized by very talented NLP experts. The truth of the matter is that the more simple the recommendations, the more the unconscious personality gets affected. Mind Control Procedures There are a few personality control procedures utilized by NLP experts to control others' minds. For example, closely consider the subtle signals of people like eye movements, pupil dilation, apprehensive tics, body flush, nonverbal communication, speed of breathing, and so forth as they can be associated with the feelings of the individual. For example, eye movements can be tracked to decide how one acknowledges and processes data. Let's say you ask someone about the color of his car, which is not nearby. When he answered, his eyes moved toward the upper right corner before his answer was spoken aloud. Essentially, the eyes moving to the upper right corner would be visual recognition that he's attempting to recall the shade of the car. Real experts have even conveyed their words following the rhythm of the human heart, i.e. 45 to 72 beats per minute, so that they could create a condition of suggestibility in the listener. They often give you an anchor, which makes it simple for them to place you in a specific state just by tapping or touching you. For example, imagine that you're talking about love and you're listening to the personal experiences that an individual is sharing with you. He's recalling them, living those feelings a second time. If you can tap your fingers on the table, or touch him in a certain spot, for example, a strong touch on the left shoulder, you can associate those positive love feelings with your physical anchor. If you need the individual to recall those feelings another time, you can tap your fingers or touch the left shoulder again. You will control their feelings without them knowing it. NLP experts even use a particular set of words that appears typical, but are more suggestive. These hot words are more suggestive for being more closely associated with the five basic senses. Words and phrases like, hear this, see, feel free, in the end, implies, now, as, in light of the fact that, and so on can conjure a specific perspective like emotional, confrontational, imaginative, and observational in the brain. When you use these certain words, you can gain control over the content of your thoughts, and with practice those of others. The interspersal hypnotic technique, a form of behavioral momentum, is largely used in NLP. Basically, science has proven that when tasks include easy responses it increases the probability that less preferred and or more challenging tasks will be performed. This incognito hypnosis strategy can have an impact on an individual's psyche to a more prominent degree. However, it does not force them to perform an action they are already against, this may require a significant programming of the brain. You don't want anyone to be able to do the same to you without your full consent. Therefore, here are some ways in which you can protect yourself and your loved ones. A wide range of individuals have attempted to use NLP to talk me into buying something, or making decisions to their advantage. The following is a list of defensive strategies you can apply to defend yourself. 1. Be aware of, and careful about, individuals replicating your nonverbal communication. If you're conversing with an individual, who may or may not be into NLP, and you see that they're mimicking your body language, the way you're sitting or standing, or reflecting the way you're holding your hands, test them by making a couple of specific movements and checking whether they try to emulate you or not. Gifted NLPers will have practiced veiling this, however, 
novice NLPers will be more likely to duplicate your intended movement. 2. Move your eyes in irregular and unpredictable directions. Particularly in the initial phases of establishing affinity, a NLP client will give careful consideration to your eyes. You may believe this is because they're seriously inspired by what you're saying. They're watching your eye movements to discover how you store and then retrieve data. In no time flat, they won't just have the capacity to tell when you're lying or making something up, but they'll also have the capacity to determine what parts of your mind you're utilizing while you're talking. This can help them tune into what you're thinking, and how you're thinking it, so that they appear to have some sort of psychic knowledge into your deepest thoughts. Weird, right? Well, if you've read my other books on persuasion, you should know by now how the eye accessing cues work. An astute hack for this is just to haphazardly shoot your eyes around, admire the walls, to one side, side to side, down, make it appear to be natural, without a precise pattern. This will drive a NLP individual completely nuts because you'll be diverting from their assessment. 3. Try not to give anyone a chance to touch you. This is quite clear, although, a bit difficult to apply in everyday life. In any case, suppose you're having a discussion with some person you know practices NLP, and the conversation puts you in an emotional state, you could be laughing real hard, become furious, or start uncontrollably weeping, then the individual touches you. For example, patting you on the back or tapping you on the shoulder. This will anchor that emotion with that physical interaction. Then, on the off chance that they need to put you back in the exact same emotional state, they can touch you in the same way, on the same spot. 4. Listen for dubious language. An essential strategy NLP borrowed from Milton Erickson is the use of dubious language to initiate trance or hypnosis. Erickson found that indirect language is capable of leading individuals into a trance state, because that indirect language can tap into an individual's unconscious response patterns. On the other hand, using more direct language could prevent an individual from entering hypnosis because it may not connect at the unconscious level. Former President Obama used this particular strategy in the Change campaign. It's an ambiguous word, and every audience will read their own agenda in it. 5. Listen for, make you an offer, language. Have you ever heard, or used, phrases like, don't hesitate to unwind or, the pleasure is all mine for you to sample this food or test drive this car, etc. or, make yourself at home. Watch out for this. This is noteworthy knowledge from pre-NLP therapeutic specialists like Erickson, an ideal approach to inspire a person to accomplish something is by asking them to give you authorization. That's the reason gifted specialists will, by and large, never direct you to a specific act, go into a stupor. Instead, they will use phrases like, please, take all the time you need. 6. Listen for nonsense. Nonsense can be summed up in garbage phrases like, the more you release this emotion, you can move confidently into any situation with the force of your increasing prosperity. The specialist isn't really making a clear statement. Simply, they're attempting to program your internal reactions and shift your thoughts toward the feeling or reaction they prefer. Thwart these attempts by asking things like, would you be more straightforward, or, what precisely do you mean by that? Two things will happen, it disrupts the strategy and shifts the discussion into clear, concise language, breaking the hypnotic strength of the dubious language examined earlier. 7. Find the hidden meaning. Individuals practicing NLP rely on language with subtle and or layered implications. With the statement, Healthy nourishment and regular sleep for me are far more critical than anything else, wouldn't you say? It appears to be undeniable, and you could likely concur with little question or thought. Beyond any doubt, nourishment and rest are vital, but that isn't the only vital thing happening in that statement. You might be wondering, what's the subtle or layered message? Healthy nourishment and regular sleep for me are far more critical, even though the speaker emphasized themselves and their opinion. The structure of the closing question, wouldn't you say, asks you to consent to it. That's the first step toward the make you an offer language discussed earlier. 8. Be aware of your attention. Exercise extreme caution when daydreaming around people who practice NLP. Even looking off into the distance is enough to welcome a word or touch that might trigger your unconscious. Here's an illustration 
a NLP client wanted to motivate me to provide unpaid work for some brand marketing. For a second, I wasn't paying complete attention, basically staring off into space. And, without letting a single second pass by, she began with the not-so-subtle attempt to practice the power of suggestion, C.7. She started by discussing how she almost never uses her marketing budget, because outlets and business vendors send her samples and review copies of products and media for no cost. No upfront costs, she murmured. Everything I need, anything, I just get it for free. She'd simply made it too easy to catch on. 9. Remember you are in control. When you are being presented with a choice, give yourself a chance to think it over and avoid making large or small decisions off the cuff. Try to give yourself at least 24 hours before settling on a choice. Especially, if you think, or realize, you're being controlled. Remember you are in control, and simply remove yourself. NLP systems are most used by sales and retail employees to trigger hasty purchases. When you recognize this, simply leave, you don't have to accept just because something is offered. 10. Follow your instincts. Most essential to this list, when your gut reacts first, you wonder if this person is messing with you, something feels too good to be true, or you just feel uncomfortable, don't ignore it. Especially if you work regularly with NLP individuals, quite often, they can appear to be shady. If you feel confident enough, or that it won't endanger your safety, call them out on using NLP methods and leave the situation or ask that they stop. Chapter 6, Powerful Social Media Persuasion Techniques Now we will explore six techniques used by the greatest social media influencers to persuade people in the virtual world. These techniques can be absolutely helpful if your purpose is to make your voice, your opinions, or your ideas heard, repeated, and valued, in other words, if you want your message to be influential. I'm sure you'll recognize most of them. In fact, the persuasion principles are always the same, whether you're trying to influence offline or online, but it's interesting to see how versatile they are. 1. Reciprocation. Basically, the rule of reciprocation says that you should try to repay what another person has already provided you. If someone does you a favor, you should find a way to do him or her another one in return. If you receive a birthday present, for example, you should remember then the other person's birthday and give him or her a gift in return. Again, if someone invites you to a party, you should then invite this person back to one of your parties. At least, that's what society has taught us since we were little kids, and we carry this form of social pressure with us when we grow up. This kind of reciprocation is actually the same in the social media world. For example, we are more likely to retweet someone who has already retweeted us. Or we link to people who have linked to us before. Also, we usually have more trust in a business after we have been provided with free value. Used manipulatively, this fact can turn into a boost that can help you to have thousands of followers in a really short time, and none of whom may actually care about what you're saying, or writing, or selling. It's worth it, right? It can be used in a more positive and constructive way, too, of course. If you concentrate on initiating reciprocity by providing free value or service to people in your network, you will then earn far more influence with them. And not because the gift economy is a new concept in marketing, but because following the rule of reciprocity is how we are wired as humans, it's simply something in our nature. 2. Commitment and Consistency After making a choice or taking a stand, we will encounter personal and interpersonal pressures to behave consistently with that commitment. This commitment and its pressures will make us act in certain ways, so that we can easily justify the decisions we've made. You, as I do, probably follow too many people on Instagram. And maybe you are signed up for RSS feeds or newsletters that just fill your inbox, more than you can really read daily. Regularly reducing your following list or unsubscribing from newsletters you don't read would eliminate many of these distractions, then you could concentrate your effort on what you are really interested in and increase your social media signal-to-noise ratio. You should follow only mentors and people that can motivate you daily, not distract you. My personal favorites are Grant Cardone, Gary Vaynerchuk, and Jason Capital. But usually people never perform that list purge or unsubscribe from unhelpful newsletters. Part of it can be traced back to reciprocation, 
but a larger part depends on consistency. You loathe to admit that you made a mistake subscribing or following those people or newsletters. There is also a positive side, for example, you may have noticed that you are more likely to comment on a blog or retweet a tweet that you have already commented on before. This happens especially if you're now signed in to comment on the blog during future visits. In applying the principle of consistency, you want to remind people of their earlier positive commitments through incentives, public display, and an easy operation to improve their commitment. It works for Amazon Prime, for example, and especially Amazon's reviewer system. And it will work for developing blog comments in a blog community, too. 3. Social proof. In daily life, we often determine correct behavior with a method that lots of people use, and may not realize it, vicarious learning. This type of learning is based on seeing what other people do, or have been taught is correct, and then modeling them. Thinking about your own life, how often have you viewed a behavior as more correct after you see other people doing it first? For example, if you are at a party with good music but no one is dancing, you would hardly start dancing on your own. But when someone else at the party, for some strange and personal reason, starts dancing, it's more probable that you and the other guys and girls will start dancing too, in a sort of collective attraction to the music. Coming back to social media, this same idea applies. Think about how impressed you feel when someone else has a ton of blog subscribers, YouTube views, Twitter and Instagram followers, Facebook likes, or even many good reviews on Amazon. Yes, you might think that they have used some tricks or gamed the system, example autofollow and similar, but the initial reaction to the huge amount of people around someone on a social media profile will always be the same combination of disbelief, amazement, and probably also a bit of envy. To combine these ideas, vicarious learning in an unconscious, peer pressure, of sorts, gives us the concept of social proof. Companies and individuals alike that focus on the positive side of this concept can gain long-term and loyal customers. Reciprocation even plays a small role through the creation of value for others. You might be wondering how. Let's say you're a blogger with an interest in publishing looking for more followers. You could start by offering to write engaging content for guest spots on blogs you already follow, propose to interview independent authors with a new book, or things like that. Doing activities like these alone does not provide social proof. It's when those bloggers and authors follow your blog in exchange for the content you created that social proof starts to work on the readers that choose to follow you after that. But, it also helps you to have a small support network capable of giving you some retweets and blog comments before seeking out your favorite bloggers and authors. And when we talk about social proof, having a good network really matters. It's not just about what people do on social media that creates proof but it is especially what other people and peers on the same wavelength are doing in a certain moment. So, if you want to follow the principle of social proof, you should concentrate your social media efforts on finding and building social proof within your own tribe. If you want to build social proof to attract girls, post high-quality pictures in which you're surrounded by girls while you're doing outdoor activities or hanging out with cool friends. Have them like and comment under your pictures. The same principle applies if you're trying to attract new customers for your business. Have your existing clients comment positively under your posts and pictures, get a lot of positive, high-quality testimonials, both written and in video format. The more social proof you can display, the better. 4. Liking It's known that we prefer to say yes to people we know and like. Let's have a look at the reasons why this happens. Physical attractiveness creates a halo effect, and it invokes the principle of liking. Keep your hair clean and trimmed, dress well, and make sure clothes fit you perfectly. We like people who are similar to us. We like people who compliment us. We like things close to our daily life and that are familiar to us. Cooperation toward dual efforts inspires enhanced liking. An association with both bad or good things influences how people feel about us. Of course, these points work for social media as well. The equivalent of physical attractiveness in the virtual world exists, because we give extra credit and credence to charmingly designed blogs, pages, videos, pictures, and every message produced with higher production quality. 
and also corporations pages showing a better sense of social media practicality and savvy in their home page design and layout. In the same way, individuals involved in coordinating joint ventures for the common good are associated with those efforts, invoking cooperation toward a joint effort, to increase the liking effect even further. Talking about complimenting others, it's easy to think about a retweet, a track back, or a positive comment and see these things as social compliments. Those are all activities you should participate in being totally sincere, free, and authentic if you want to employ the principle of liking to your own advantage. 5. Authority. In social media, authority basically focuses on virtual trappings, less than titles and clothes, as in real life. There's a huge difference between perceived expertise and real expertise. It means that someone known for blogging about a certain subject, for example offering an intelligent commentary on a subject, will probably be perceived as a more trusted expert than a true, but unknown, non-blogging, expert. So, the first one has a bigger online influence as an authority, whether this is, built up or real. Maybe the shortest measure of authority is the number of people who will blindly buy or download a suggested resource or service based just on the authority's endorsement. How many people would buy or download something if an important blogger, or YouTuber, or an Instagram influencer with thousands of followers says it is something that really needed to be read, or used, or just to have it at home? One thing social media seems to spark is a clear understanding that authority is, or at least, should be, limited to a legitimate and a finite field of knowledge. So, make an effort to pay attention to people trying to convince you to buy something just because they have many followers, or positive reviews, or so on when it's clear that the field they deal within is not their real field of expertise. 6. Scarcity. After reciprocity, this is probably the most used tool in social media. When bloggers, or anyone else dealing with social media, create a membership or subscription service, a newsletter, a closed group, or other things like these, it is never for an unlimited number of users or for an unlimited time. It's normal to see constructed limits, such as seats available, length of time to buy, etc. to maintain a certain level of scarcity. This way, they can create stable competition for services and prices, with the possibility of increasing the price and still selling at the same rate. Now you know how these weapons of influence are usually used against us by compliance professionals, but I also would encourage you to practice and use in your life the positive side of wielding influence to attain your purposes. In fact, especially in this fast-growing virtual reality, if you're not using social media on others, they're using it on you. Their ways are often subtle and easy to miss, but I think you'll be more aware of them after reading this chapter. And when you're aware of something, you can defend yourself against it. Here are some constructive ways to apply and master the principles of influence to increase your social media status, and to increase it in the real world, as well. Focus on creating value and initiating the reciprocity relationship by giving some gifts to your social media contacts with highly valuable content for them. Compliment your friends, subscribers, and commenters sincerely, answering them in time and taking care of your community. Pay back compliments by commenting on their blogs, retweeting their tweets, liking their comments, and sharing their links. Always stay in touch with them, trying to reach out to them whenever it's possible. Remember to engage consistently on the social media platforms you decided to use, and stay away from new social media platforms that you are not logically able to use. That's okay, maybe you just don't have the right resources, time, ability, etc., to participate and remain active on them. Practice learn by doing, and practice some more. When you become a master of a platform, you'll be able to apply what you've learned to new platforms, cutting the learning curve in half. Use social proof as reliability signals wherever it is suitable. For example, show off your number of subscribers, or followers, next to the subscribe, or follow, button. Start asking for high-quality testimonials. Try also to build up your network by commenting, retweeting, etc. Create a professional and inspiring design. It should be endearing, easy to understand, and easy to navigate, even if it's a blog or a Facebook page. Be sure that every element is exactly where your users think it should be. Edit your pictures to make them appear professional and high quality, 
A cool app you can use to easily modify your photos is called Snapseed. When you want to create a scenario that requires an immediate action, recall the scarcity principle to positively guide their behavior. But be honest about it. Don't change dates, times, or prizes at the last moment, and avoid weird things that might destroy the trust that you have built with a major effort of persuasion. Chapter 7 Mind Control Secrets Have you ever wondered if mind control can be real? Have you ever had the desire to manipulate and control other people's minds? Have you ever wanted to try these things and see how they really work? Well, you're in the right place now. Continue reading this last chapter of the book to discover the power of mind control and how it works. Let's begin with saying that of course you can't completely control your friends, partners, customers, or whoever you are in touch with to do exactly what you want, or to transform them in mindless robots. Well, maybe we'll be able to do that one day in the future, but not yet. What you can do is subtly influence them, without them being aware of it. It's known that humans are often not in control of their actions, decisions, and behaviors, even though they believe the opposite is true. For instance, most of us have the deep belief that we have a stable sense of self that remains consistent, and that we can predict how we would act in the future. Could we really be so sure of how we'll behave in extreme situations? Are we masters of our state, actions, and behaviors, or are we slaves, subject to others' control? Most people would believe that, during a crisis, they could remain calm, cool, and collected, lead others, behave heroically, or maintain their core beliefs no matter what happens. Ask yourself, would you still be, you, during the zombie apocalypse? Would you stick to your moral code? Could you resist controversial orders from an established authority figure? I'm not sure anyone could, and here's why. The truth is, very few people could accurately predict how they'd act in extreme situations. To find the reason behind this, we have to look inside your brain. When you find yourself under heavy pressure or in a stressful situation, your brain releases a hormone cascade that makes you experience a flight or fight reaction. This physiological reaction helps us survive in dangerous encounters, but shuts down a lot of higher functioning. This might have been a great system for surviving a saber-toothed tiger attack. But in our modern world, where we actually need our higher functioning in dangerous encounters, it's not so effective to defend ourselves from others' control. So, in other words, when we experience extreme situations, or our survival is threatened, we may not think clearly or act in typical ways. To prove this point, two psychological experiments were done in the 1960s and 70s. The first was a highly controversial study by Stanley Milgram a psychologist from Yale University, exploring the phenomenon of obedience. During this study, volunteers were told that they would be participating in a learning study. They were seated at a panel with a microphone, a speaker, and a dial. The experimenter was in the same room, wearing a white lab coat, which is a traditional symbol of authority, just think about your doctor, would it feel the same to you if he wore a tank top and shorts during your visit? Participants were told that the learner, an actor selected by Milgram, was in another room, they would be required to ask the learner prescripted questions using the microphone, and they would hear the response on the speaker. If the learner gave the wrong answer, the volunteer was directed to administer an electric shock by setting the voltage on the dial. The dial had labels ranging from mild all the way through to extremely painful and even fatal. Volunteers were told by the experimenter to keep giving shocks at increasing intensity, although, they could hear the learner was in pain, including, of course, simulated screams. If the volunteer refused to continue, he or she was told to continue by the authority with the following script. Please continue. The experiment requires that you continue. It is absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, you must go on. Here's the scary part, although they experienced extreme stress, an astonishing 65% of volunteers administered the lethal shock, and those who insisted on ending the experiment didn't ask to check the well-being of the learner. Most volunteers claimed they would never behave this way, but couldn't stand up to the authority. Milgram was interested in researching how far people would go in obeying an instruction if it involved harming another person, and he attempted to explain how easily ordinary people could be influenced into committing atrocities like the Nazis in World War II. 
The other disturbing study was the Stanford Prison Experiment run by Philip Zimbardo, which showed how people are easily manipulated into behaving in sadistic and cruel ways. A basement at Stanford University was modified to look exactly like a real prison, and a group of students volunteered for the simulation. They were randomly assigned to the role of prisoner or officer. Originally planned to run for two weeks, the experiment was shut down after only six days because of the ruthless, vicious behavior by the officers, who started behaving in sadistic ways toward the prisoners. Like the Milgram study, before the experiment, all the participants believed they would have stuck to their moral code, but found themselves acting in highly unpredictable ways in only a few days' time. Some of them developed their roles as officers and enforced authoritarian measures and subjected the prisoners to psychological tortures. During the following years, other experiments have demonstrated that we tend to agree with a group of people, even though we know that we're right and they're wrong, we'll slack off when we're working in a larger group, because we can get away with it, we'll often behave out of character as a member of a crowd, and can be easily manipulated into changing our opinion under certain conditions, such as authority, scarcity, safety, or comfort. Not only does this research demonstrate how easily and rapidly we can change our mind, but the scariest thing is the rationalization that we practice. After the act, most people will rationalize their behavior, convincing themselves that they actively chose the action and refusing to acknowledge or believe they were manipulated. Not only that, now, it gets scarier. Our perception is limited, which means a part of what goes on isn't consciously available, especially, when we are focused on something else. Two studies demonstrate this phenomenon clearly. In the first, experimenters asked participants to watch a video of people passing a basketball, the goal was to notice the number of passes by the players wearing a white shirt. In the middle of the video, a person in a gorilla suit walks across the screen. When focusing on the instructions, counting the passes by the people in white, most people didn't notice the gorilla running by and insisted that it wasn't there. In the second experiment, an experimenter asked random people for directions on the street. During the interaction, two fellow experimenters walked between them carrying a door, behind which the original experimenter was swapped for another person. Most of the time, the person giving directions didn't even notice. It's not just gross inattention, manipulation, and post hoc rationalization that modifies our behavior. You can use the great power of priming to change people's actions without any conscious awareness from them. For instance, read this sentence, the house is old, it creaked and groaned, struggling on its foundations. Now, try standing up. After reading that, did you move slower than normal? If so, you were primed by these words to think of old age. In a similar way, you can be primed to change your voting preference just based on the location of the polling booth. You can be primed at the grocery store, where the most expensive products are located on the shelves at eye level. Researchers claim all sorts of priming effects, suggesting that we can be manipulated without any knowledge on our part, knowing will claim that any resulting behavior was our decision. You can now understand how these principles have been applied throughout history. This is not conspiracy theory at work but represents the innate desire to persuade, and even manipulate, others to achieve our ends. Next time you see an effective TV ad, meaning you want to buy the product, you can bet you've been manipulated. A lot of the messaging that successfully manipulates works at a level far removed from our conscious attention, but you should always remember that disciplined, conscious attention towards your actions allows you to stay in control. When you notice yourself acting, or feeling persuaded to act, in ways that aren't typical, use your new awareness and try to determine which technique is at play. Mind Control and Marketing There are many other books concerning mind control, one above all is Dr. Robert Cialdini's Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, that shows clearly the scientific proof of mind control. In the next pages, I focus especially on one important topic, marketing. The most important thing in marketing can be summed up with just one word, yes. If you ask a commercial partner to promote your product, and he or she says, yes, if you ask your customers to buy your new product, and they say, yes, if you ask a blogger for a link, and he says, yes, well, then your blog, activity, business is working in the right way and you can really succeed. And the most important thing here is that you can learn how to do that. 
here is a concise guide to mind control. Read it and then use these tips carefully for your advertising and non-business efforts alike. 1. Don't let them think for themselves. Instead, take charge and do the work yourself. The fact is that people already have too much to think about, job, family, hobbies, friends, children, dogs, and everything else that completely fill people's minds. If you give them something else to think about, they can easily break down or step away from the offer you present altogether. So, it could be a mistake to ask them to think your offer over, even if it's new. Keep in mind, people usually adjust their focus away from what isn't really important to them, or they just don't think about it very hard. It's not laziness or dumbness, but because they are already too busy and overwhelmed, which makes you as a seller or blogger a pretty low priority. The first part of this strategy is to not ask them to think, and instead do it for them. Here are some guidelines. Explain in a clear way how your offer will help, boost, or sustain your audience, show examples, the social proof discussed earlier, of similar situations where your product or service worked well. Have an idea for an event or learning opportunity? Rather than seeking prep work from your customers, do it for them, plan the event, complimentary web pages, and email campaigns needed. Then, provide them with those complete products, with everything already working and ask for their assistance in finalizing the event. Online reviews can make or break a product or service. Rather than waiting for customers to write the reviews you need, provide a handful of clear, customizable examples in a strategic list of where they could be posted. Be specific and clear. Explain yourself and show proof. Tell them exactly what to do step by step and why, and they will be more than happy to tell you, yes, for everything you are going to ask them. 2. Start from a little snowball. A successful marketing campaign always starts from something little, to then grow bigger and bigger as things go on. To achieve your ideal, yes, the hard part is to obtain the first one. But if you get it from the right person, then getting all the other, yes, will be very easy. It's like an avalanche, you get a little snowball going down from the top of the mountain and then it becomes a huge and powerful wall of snow. Here are some guidelines. Try to get someone popular, e.g. a blogger or an influencer, to share your post, however, this is not an easy trip. You may need to practice some reciprocity first, but if they do it just one time, then many other people may retweet, like, or share your post with their followers. And the more time passes, the more it increases. If you can convince an expert in your field of interest to promote your product or service, then the people who also follow that expert will want to know more about it and be likely to share it, as well. Again, if you can persuade, maybe with some mind control techniques, a public figure, or a celebrity, to create a testimonial for your product or service, which is very hard work, then you will see your sales increase so fast you can't even imagine and you will find many other testimonials with little effort. So, don't be frightened about the hard work you'll have to do at the beginning to get people to help you, because after that, you will see that the road is all downhill and you will begin to see concrete results earlier than you might have imagined. 3. Ask for a little thing, take a big one. Have you ever heard the expression, give them an inch, and they will take a mile? While it's usually given as advice, a warning against others' greed, it can be great marketing. If you want to obtain something, don't jump for the whole thing right away. Remember the snowball from point number 2 and getting that first, yes. It's the easiest way to get started, and reduces the risk of wasted time or effort. Then, you can start asking for more, and more, and more, when the results of your effort reveal themselves. And it's not really unethical, or even manipulation, if you think about it. Why wouldn't you push for more if things are going well? It's not psychological trickery or anything like that, it's just smart business. No one likes to risk everything immediately maybe just some crazy poker players, and so offering progressive levels of commitment will really increase your chances of making them say, yes, without any regret. 4. Establish a real deadline. As you know, deadlines are important because they create a sense of urgency. But always remember, the important thing is that the deadline you set should be real. How many times has a salesman told you to come back as soon as possible when he or she sees that you're not very convinced? 
may be telling you that there are other people coming later and you could lose your opportunity by not acting now. This happens so many times in our life. People lie to you or simply pitch you with artificial deadlines, thinking that this will really motivate you to act. Everyone uses this technique, teachers, bosses, wives, and husbands. It's very likely you've used this technique, too. The takeaway here? Don't take this ineffective route. You should, instead, concentrate on generating real urgency. It's not hard, and can be built up with your current marketing plan. For example, if you create content, don't leave free data on your page or blog for an indeterminate time. Consider employing scarcity here, and say that it will be available for a limited time, after which, you will start charging a cost for it. The specific deadline will boost the number of downloads you receive, and fellow bloggers can boost promotion efforts while your report is still free. Rather than waiting for customer testimonials, like we touched on in point number one, let them know there is a precise timeline to respect, especially, that they have to come in by a specific date. Don't think of it as something like a dictatorship, but as helping them be more serious and respectful of the work you are doing for them and for yourself. 5. Be generous give more than you take. This concept takes us right back to reciprocity, but the takeaway here is how much you should do. It goes beyond a one-for-one ratio, think 10 to 1. For example, if you're going to ask for a link, you should have already given 10 links. If you're going to ask for a promotion, you should have already given 10 promotions. Simply, smart marketers don't resort to a one-to-one ratio, instead, they give 10 and take just one. And that goes beyond action, think about value. If you're going to ask for 100 visitors, you should have already sent 1,000 visitors. If you're going to ask for $1,000 in products or services sales, you should have already sold $10,000 of their products and services. This is about generosity, and it's a nice way to be sure they always lean closer to, yes. And I know it's a lot of work to do, but, trust me, it works and it's worth it. This is the price of influence, and you will see real results and income. 6. Support a cause beyond your interests. Standing for something greater than yourself makes people care. And it can be applied to nearly everything. Rather than write another how to post, stop and consider writing about an important issue, something you are really passionate about and with a strong logic structure. Thinking of starting another consulting business? You could do something bigger something that can really change your customers' lives, and lead a movement. From there, you could inspire your customers, take time and write a more important book, about your philosophy maybe. Include many concrete and big examples, maybe about your own life, instead of writing another step-by-step manual. Those are the kind of things that people want to talk, read, or know about. They will be grateful to you just because you've given them the possibility to help you make the world a better place. 7. Make no room for shame. A great marketer is the one who takes shamelessness as one of the most important principles of gaining influence. And I'm not talking about lacking conscience, or being an extroverted person, or any other stereotype usually connected to how a marketer works. Simply, several of them are just false. By shamelessness, I mean the resolute belief that what you are doing will benefit the world and the determination to do anything to make it real. When you believe in your products or services, you don't need to lie about them to sell them. Because you really know your products or services can help your customers, and so it becomes a personal duty to share the word, get them to buy, no matter how. When you believe in your message, you don't just publish and then immediately forget about what you wrote. Instead, you promote your books, your posts, whatever your content, daily, weekly, or even hourly. You will work without stopping to share your content to everyone you think needs it to succeed, and you will refuse to rest until you reach your goal. It should not be about money, or glory, or legacy. It's about really believing in what you do and say. It's about being charmed, about being so in love with what you do and what it can provide. It's about bringing to life this beautiful vision you have. It's about fighting for what you believe in with every resource you have. If you really feel this way, Well, listen to me, you can achieve nearly anything. Conclusion We all wish to manipulate people at some time, other times, we get manipulated. 
Our intentions can be selfless or selfish, but manipulation is a fact of life. You can sit and argue about the ethics of it all, or you can actually use it to your own advantage. Remember, if you're not using these techniques, someone else is using them on you. Just by being aware of them, you can now recognize them and defend yourself, your best friends, and your family. In this book, I've tried to cover all the ways and means of manipulating people and being compelling enough to get them to do what you want. I've also discussed neuro-linguistic programming and its role in manipulation, including how you can protect yourself from manipulation by others. Now, if you found this book helpful, why don't you leave a quick review on Amazon.com? I'd love to read your feedback, whether positive or negative. In fact, your honest opinion can help me improve this book in the future, so don't hold back. Leave a review on Amazon.com for this book and let me know what you think. Good luck, see you next time. Whether you'll get another book of mine, or join the VIP newsletter by clicking the link below, I'll be ready to share more knowledge and techniques with you. Talk soon. Robert Moore